students who are in the class, um, welcome. And this is a pilot and a kind of exciting pilot that we're going to walk through so you can understand what we're doing and where we're going um, with this unique class um, that we're pretty excited to host. So let's go on to the next slide. So we'll start you know with and we'll probably have this slide in several times just so everyone is aware that we will be meeting via zoom but more importantly that we'll be using the same link right sarji the whole semester so save this zoom link um again for csu students this is a michigan tech link um it's not a csu link um so just be sure you need to s send that in in the future if you have any trouble logging in you will need to use slack or twitter to contact us to make sure that we know if there's some trouble. And we'll make sure we post all that regularly so everybody can see how to, like, hey, I'm stuck, I can't get in, or the email's not working or whatever, because we don't always see our email that quickly. Let's go on to the next slide. So our, our main purpose today is to introduce all of our, as a leadership team, um, and get you guys set up what's gonna be an exciting adventure of working on a multi-institutional and diverse task that will work on international negotiations. So I'll start real quickly and then introduce everybody else. Um, my name is Gillian Bowser. I'm with the Department of Ecosystem Science and Sustainability at Colorado State University. I've been here eek, now a long time, I think 10 years, and Sarah's been with me, what, nine of those 10 years or something crazy like that. <laughs> um, I actually first met her parents when she was an incoming freshman, so she's sort of been stuck with me ever since. Um, it's been an exciting voyage, but actually I first started with the National Park Service. I worked for the National Park Service for several decades um, in parks in Yellowstone, Tetons, Wrangell St. Elias, Fort Clapsic, Badlands, uh, Joshua Tree, and several others. So if you have any questions about a national park, um, I can certainly probably help you answer them. Um, but in the context of this class, I've also attended the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change since COP15, which was in Copenhagen. Um, so I have a good experience and a strong interest in the international negotiation where they sit. So let's go on to the next slide. And Sarah, that's you. I know I have. I have to unmute myself. So, hi, my name is Sarah. Um, this is me looking at a monarch, being super geeky with the double chin. Um, I'm a third year PhD student at CSU um, in the ecology program. Um, that's my email address. So, if you ever need to reach out to me, um, of course, use Slack, use Twitter, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but you have my email as well. Um, I have been a part of this group for the past two years. So, in 2018, I I took the course that was kind of like a yeah pilot um, at CSU. It was um, back then a seminar course. And then in 2019, um, took the course more like as a, a TA teaching assistant um, help. So I've been to, um, this is incorrect, I've actually only been to two COPs. This year would have been my third. Um, but I've been to Poland and Madrid with groups of students helping with this project. Um, you know, looking at how students can be engaged in um, sustainable development goals and climate action within their higher education and their research goals. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm Gillian's grad student. I've been along and at CSU for way too long, it feels like at this point, um, but I study pollinators in protected areas um, and I'm just really passionate about this and looking forward to working with you all this semester and beyond. So what this class is part of is um, actually a brand new National Science Foundation grant called the Youth Environmental Alliance in Higher Education, otherwise known as YAY. And what you can see in this slide is um, all the founding institutions of which we have several members online. And so I'm gonna have them all introduce themselves as they come in and off of online. And if I've missed anybody, throw a message in the chat or if you're on the phone, just speak up and say, hey, you missed me um, to make sure that we get everyone introduced. And for this first class, that's our main idea is to give all the students an idea of how diverse the class is. And also with that reminder that there'll be other students watching this video. So that's why we're going through it in some detail. Um, but also this is a five year grant. So this is year one of five. Um, so our hope is that in the next four classes, we will have uh, a nice diversity of students and different actual international locations that we can actually go to um, as travel restrictions change and, and the list. 
So this gives you an idea of the suite of universities. Um, I'll read them off. There's another slide with all the universities in case you can't read them. It's Colorado State, Michigan Tech, which is Sarah who can wave, um, University of Derby in the UK, um, who is probably in bed because they're nine hours difference, Monash University in Australia, University of Connecticut, who's out doing field samples today, Vanderbilt University, Leanne can wave, um, Ravian College, I don't know if I saw Diane on yet, she said she might be a little bit late, um, well she can wave when she gets in, um, Vanderbilt, I don't think Vanderbilt's on yet, um, what did I miss over here? I think I can't even read my you own were things. going the right direction and then you turned around. So you were. Oh, that's right. Yeah, Leah's already here. I'm, I'm, I'm Vanderbilt. <laughs> Vanderbilt's here. <laughs> um, and I will say that um, Moravian College, the YAF fellow, Melissa Morales. Um, hopefully, I said that right, Melissa. She is joining us. So, welcome, Melissa. Okay, we're going to do the Thanks. fellows in a second. Colorado College is Sarah H., who's a grave. And then Boston University is Pam, who will be on the call later today. So, let's go on to the next slide. And by the end of this, you'll know all these acronyms. Um, so I wanted to do real quickly before we introduce our Yay Fellows is to see where they show you them all, show you all where they fit in this structure. So again, this is a National Science Foundation grant. And part of what it does is fund this joint class to bring students together, to give them the opportunity to meet and work with students well, for this year, meet virtually um, and work with students from other institutions with shared common interests. And in this case, it's on sustainability, sustainable development, and international negotiations. To do this, we use modules. So what you'll see is we refer a lot to these modules. And part of what the modules do is for our future network for the next four years, these types of uh, classes will be shared um, so that other institutions can come in and see that so when we do our big virtual teams, we have a, a sort of a growing network of institutions and students interested in sustainable development. We also, which will be under Michigan Tech, will have a library of these modules that will be freely available to all the members of EA. And you as students can view any of these modules at any time for research, for background information, so forth. So we will also have a, a library associated that with articles and we have started some of that to get everyone sort of up to speed is what's happening with sustainable development, um, environmental negotiations, and other such venues. The main thing that the grant actually funds is what we call the Yay Fellows. And I'm really glad to see some of the Yay Fellows online, even though we're sort of scrambling to get all their paperwork in place. Um, and we hope you get all your paperwork in place pretty quickly. Um, these are senior undergraduate or graduate interns. <coughs> Excuse me. Will act more as a leadership role. And what the leadership role means is that each of these teams that you will be assigned to during the semester will actually have a student leader, uh, which will be a Yay Fellow. And part of their job is to usher these projects all the way to completion. We have some hardcore final um, professional uh, presentations that we are targeting with these um, projects. So we're not just doing a final project that will be internal to the university. Most of these final projects or products will be part of either an international organization or international conference and shared with an international audience. For this year, we will be doing a virtual conference, oops, a little too fast there, um, hosted by the University of Derby. Um, and that will sort of mimic what we did last year with a virtual conference, but also gives us a way to practice before, um, since we do not have the actual COP itself. And we'll talk more about that later. And final presentations for most years will be at the actual climate change conference. Um, next year is in Glasgow, Scotland. Uh, we do not yet know the following years because those are determined by the UN each year. Now we can go to the next slide. So what does that look like is getting to a network of institutions all working together, um, which means sort of synchronous, um, to use the sustainable development goals as a teaching tool. And what we're showing on this slide here is just some of the um, outcomes from our pilot, which includes, this is two projects where the student team takes one SDG and focuses on that SDG using case studies or research, their own research or research they're interested in or activities on campus to build a presentation around that SDG. So as you can see here is the SDG 12, 
was built by three institutions. It was actually led, I believe this one was led by Clark University um, with Colorado State and Michigan Tech. There's another example on the bottom there, Flow Forward was on a water, um, which was Michigan Tech, uh, Clark University, and it looks like they used another logo for Colorado State. So that gives you an idea of where we're going. These are these three presenta these two presentations were presented at Madrid, Spain, um, to an international audience as part of what they called press conferences. So our idea is to give you guys that by the end of this experience, the professional development opportunities to see what actually goes on in that global space around sustainability and environmental negotiations. Next slide. So how is this organized? We do have once a week a synchronous lecture. Not all the classes meet at the same time. That was pretty rough to do with all the different time zones. But we are asking that all the fellows maintain the, this time as a time to uh, meet and be live with us as much as you can. Um, other classes may join in later. I believe uh, Sarah H's class joins in next week. Other classes may join in as they are able. All of these lectures are recorded and archived so everyone can see the information presented and work together on it. Given that virtual class consists of different universities, we will also be using a platform for the teams to work together on a time that they mutually agree to. So on your individual teams, you will be doing work as a team um, using one of the platforms. We use Slack and Sarah will talk more about that later. Um, so you'll have working times outside of this one class time. Um, and in part because you may have a student on your team from Monash University, um, so you have to figure out a time that will work for everybody to get together and spend some time working on your project. So it's important that you set your own meeting times and that's one of the goals of this project. Next slide. Okay, so now I'm gonna get the chance to introduce everybody who didn't really introduce themselves. So again, I'm Gillian Bowser. Um, and my colleague in crime here is Pam from Boston University. Um, the two of us have worked together with the Ecological Society of America. Um, Pam is currently on the, still the, the Vice President for Diversity and Education in the Ecological Society of America. I'm um, an important partner. And we will introduce the Yays Fellows, I believe her Yay Fellow is on the call. Next slide. Yeah, and before I go to the next slide, um, if anyone has any questions while Gillian's going through these slides, Feel free to put it in the chat box on Zoom, um, or you can unmute yourself, um, you know, before she says next slide, um, and happy to field any questions that folks. Okay, is Diane on yet? She said she might be a little bit late. I have not seen Diane yet. Okay, so I'll introduce but Diane. That's, but that's Anna Wally. Yeah, there's Adewale, yeah, he's actually Sarah Green student. <laughs> um, this is from last year's COP um, in Madrid, Spain. Um, Diane Husick is the Dean of the College of Health and Human, Health, Human and Environmental Sciences, I believe is the full title, at Moravian College in Pennsylvania. Diane has been to, I think, 15 different COPs um, and is currently the well, on the executive committee was called the Research and Independent NGO. And we will go through acronyms working with the UN. Um, you can actually pop in the chat box. If anyone's had any experience working with any UN documents or UN processes or UN bodies, you can pop that in the chat. But I'm sure we can all get a thumbs up on that UN has more acronyms than you ever dreamed of. Um, so we will have an acronym soup for you. Um, so don't worry if you get lost in the acronyms. Um, so Diane is in charge of what's called the Ringos. The, the acronyms are pretty cute. I like the Ringos, the Bingos, and the Youngos. But she's with the Ringos. Next slide. Okay, this is Jessie, who I do not believe is on today. I think her class starts next week as well. Um, Jessie is an anth uh, environmental anthropologist from Indiana University. She has a larger class, um, which has, I believe, 40 students. So you'll see students from Indiana University popping in and out, and she does have a Yay Fellow. I'm not sure if that fellow's online, but we'll introduce all the fellows in a moment. Um, it, uh, Jessie has also been with the IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and you guys will hear a lot about that this semester if you're not familiar with that. Okay, next slide. Sarah H, this is you. Hey. 
unmute myself. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm new to this group. I went to my first COP, uh, COP25 in Madrid last December and was delighted to meet this group of people. I had for two years been teaching a course called Anthropocene that looks at questions of sustainability and resiliency from an anthropological perspective. Um, it's also been a class with strong community-based learning um, and partnership components, which I'm hoping to still carry into this fall um, by bicycle commuting. We'll see what happens with that. Um, I'm a political anthropologist with feminist orientation by training, and my work has been mostly in Brazil on gender-based violence and uh, um, militarization and war trauma in the United States. So switching to climate change might seem like a big switch, but I think a lot of what I've learned about violence and trauma um, carries over quite nicely. My three fellows were part of this Anthropocene course. It has an unusual history that I won't go into, but because of that, this class has really been focused on some of the existential aspects of, of climate crisis and um, what, to use Donna Haraway's um, phrase, staying, tuning the, this, the, the self, the activist instrument for effectively staying with the trouble. And maybe my fellows will have more to say about that, but delighted to join you all. Thank you, Sarah. Angela, just going to comment that as we get as we go through the semester and as we get onto Twitter, you'll find some of the larger groups that are very active within the UN structure are the women's major group or the women and gender constituency as they're known, and also the local and an indigenous cultures group. And the students who went last year were fortunate enough to actually see those two groups, uh, or actually the local and indigenous group receive formal recognition from the UN. And what that means for the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change is that for all bodies associated with climate change, they must consider local and indigenous communities and their voices as part of the negotiation process. So we'll talk more about that, but it's important to see that there are nine major groups. Women and gender is the oldest major group. Um, and given the UN's history of being founded by a woman, Eleanor Roosevelt, that these groups are quite active in the international stage. So let's go on to the next slide. Sarah G, this is you. I think, oh, there she is. <laughs> Sorry, sorry, classes start tomorrow. I have faculty at the door. <laughs> Hi, I'm Sarah. I'm, I'm Sarah H, one of many Sarahs. Sarah, I am Sarah G, one of many Sarahs. <laughs> um, I am um, currently interim chair of the Department of Chemistry at Michigan Tech. It's a position that I had for many years a long time ago and I am back in it for a year or two um, as interim. Um, I have taught since 2015 a, an interdisciplinary course called Climate Science and Policy, um, and I did that based on um, a year that I spent in Washington as a Jefferson Fellow, working on environmental issues with the State Department, so that's how I get my policy insight. Um, so it's not formal, it's practical. And I connected with Gillian. Here is the bit about the importance of making networks. Gillian and I both worked on the global, uh, geo global uh, outlook for the environment, geo global environmental outlook a few years ago, which was a UN program. And I met her there and we talked about taking students to COP. And so when Michigan Tech got observer status at COP, I called Gillian and said, hey, <laughs> how can we do this? And so we teamed up last year in sort of the pre-pre-pilot of this program and took students together to COP. Um, so today our classes start tomorrow, so we are not meeting today, but we'll meet on Monday and Wednesday next week with my tiny class of COVID students. So. <laughs> COVID era students. So glad to be here. Nice to meet you all. Yeah, thank you, Sarah G. And um, I put in the chat box, the Global Environmental Outlook is the GEO6. 
we actually will be using that report quite a bit. So you'll get to see more about the GO6. It took Sarah and I and what, what 52 others, something crazy, like four years to write that thing. <laughs> oh, it was a long time. It's a long process, but understanding how those assessments works is really important. Um, and Jesse, as you saw earlier, was also with the IPCC, and those reports are equally long to produce. Um, and they're, they're, what, three years for the IPCC, three, four years as well? They're up there with the same amount of time it takes to produce one global report and compile all that information. Let's go on to the next slide. Well, he's not here, so we can talk about him. Um, this is University of Derby in the UK. Andrew Ramsey, oh, I left his name out. Andrew Ramsey is a conservation biologist that we've worked with for several years. Uh, you'll hear a lot about Andrew, um, and he has 60 students in his class in conservation biology, so you most likely will have at least one of his students in his class. Um, Andrew and I first met at Colorado State University working on a project called the Rocky Mountain Sustainable and Science Network, RMSSN. You'll hear a lot about that project. Um, but Andrew is great fun and makes the most amazing Yorkshire pudding you have ever had. So hopefully you can at least virtually see what Yorkshire pudding looks like if you haven't had one yet. <laughs> Next slide. Okay, my other colleague at Colorado State University, I'm not sure that she's online. Um, I can't figure out how to see everybody who's online. It just sort of wobbles around. But Julia Klein, some of the CSU students may have had in their capstone class, um, was a professor here in the Department of Ecosystem Science and Sustainability. She's also a mean pancake maker, as you can see here in Grand Teton National Park. Um, she works mostly on mountain ecosystems and the people in those ecosystems. Next slide. And also who's not here is Susie Ho. Dr. Susie Ho is the director of the master's program for sustainability at Monash University in Australia. Um, her students worked as the sort of yay fellows last year and you'll get a chance to move um, where or meet with Susie and her students and hopefully when we all get together in Glasgow in a year or so you'll actually get to meet Susie and her, her Cracker Jack team. They're really fun to work with. Next slide. Okay, so a couple of the partners who are not here, except for Leanne is actually here. I'm here. I'm here. And Sarah's here too. <laughs> oh, so we're missing Mark Urban from University of Connecticut and Samantha Murray from Scripps Institute of Oceanography in, in San Diego. And these uh, classes will be joining in at different times and later on the semester. Connecticut is not going live this year. They will start in the spring, um, but you may see their students popping in and out. So next thing I see um, Zach is popping up from Colorado College. Thank you, Zach. Um, he's in the chat box. Um, you, we will hopefully see you next week when you join back in. And Leah, do, or Leanne, do you maybe want to give a, a brief overview of what you do? Yeah, sure. So, sorry to introduce myself. Um, so my name is Leah Dundon and I'm at Vanderbilt University. Um, I am actually an environmental lawyer and I still work for a law firm based in Washington, D.C., um, Beverage and Diamond. And I'm also, uh, I have two appointments at Vanderbilt. Um, and I have been to three COPs. I think I started in Marrakesh and found Gillian um, at one of them. And uh, that's sort of how I came to be part of this group. But um, I also spearheaded the effort at Vanderbilt to get observer status. Um, I had such an incredible and profound experience at my first COP that I came back to Vanderbilt and basically said, we've got to be involved in this and we need to teach a course. And the university was pretty supportive. Um, so I designed a course that we taught last year for the first time called Climate Change and the Glo Global Response, a Multidisciplinary Perspective. Um, and I, I, I really, I'm very appreciative of this group and this network because I feel like in a multidisciplinary approach to things is so important, especially in today's um, day and age. And so this is, uh, that was what my course was about. And then we took everyone to the COP. Um, so it's sort of a good fit, I think, for, for this group. My, my work at Vanderbilt, I'm a researcher there, and I also uh, focus on infrastructure and climate change risk, particularly to infrastructure and also sometimes transportation infrastructure we have a focus on. Um, I, uh, I also am the director of a group called the Vanderbilt Center, of, I'm sorry, the Vanderbilt Climate Change Initiative, VCCI. Um, and we're working to sort of bring together many of the different people that focus on a wide variety of climate change issues on campus um, under one umbrella. So happy to be part of this group and um, hopefully we'll see you all over the next five years. 
Thank you. Yeah, well, I forgot we had a lot of fun in, in Mayor Cash. That was a great cop. I mean, you guys will probably hear from many people those cops, um, and we'll talk all about these acronyms, uh, which are conference of the parties, are pretty life-changing experiences. They're usually attended by 200 nations. Um, so you can literally eat your way across the globe and most of these cops or at least experience cultures across the globe. And that's part of the fascination of the cops and how people negotiate in space. Next slide. So now here's our chance for the yay fellows. I know we have a couple online. So maybe Sarah, you're more familiar with the name. Sarah W, if you want to call out one by one and they can um, make sure their videos are on and introduce themselves. Yeah, certainly. So I know that um, Zach just left. I, I think he did. But Zach is a fellow. He's from Colorado College. Um, so we'll do Emma and then Cosmali. Is that how you pronounce it? Um, and then we'll do Emily um, from Colorado College, Macy, and then Melissa. And I think that's all the fellows online today. I can put that order in the chat box too. Awesome. I can start whenever. Um, so hi, I'm Emma. I'm from Boston University and I work with Pam Templer. Sarah, we lost your order. I think you <laughs> Sorry, I think there was a lot. Go ahead, Cosmali. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Cosmali Lopez. Uh, I'm thankful to be here and working with uh, Sarah Hotzinger. Hi, I'm Emily. I'm an anthropology major at CC, also working uh, with Sarah and Cosmali and Zach. Um, and I'm definitely really excited to do this work. Hi everybody, my name is Macy Hogren. Um, I am an MA student at Indiana University studying International Studies. Um, I'm very excited to work with everyone here. I went to uh, COP24, um, didn't go to COP25, but I'm excited for this project. Um, and I work with uh, Jessica O'Reilly. So you must have froze with us in Katowice, Poland, <laughs> COP24. <laughs> Hi. Yes, I did. That was freezing that year. <laughs> Can you guys hear me? Yeah, you're good. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Melissa. I'm a senior environmental science student at Moravian College. I also work for the National Park Service, so I'm kind of used to acronyms, um, but I'm excited to learn more during this fellowship. So I'm excited to be here, and I'm looking forward to working with everyone. So of course I have to ask, which park do you work with? I work at Delaware Water Gap National Recreation Area. Otherwise known as DWA. Yes. Yeah, the Park Service is famous for that. Everything is a four letter acronym, so they're DWA. I worked at Yale, Joyter, Diva, Whistle, and several others. <laughs> That's Park Service acronyms for you. Yeah. All right, it, <laughs> did we miss anybody of the fellows? I think we got most of the fellows. And again, for the rest of the team, those fellows will be part of um, different sustainable development goals. And that's gonna be one of our tasks today before we leave today, um, is sort of taking a look at those goals and deciding which ones we wanna work on. So let's go on to the next slide, because you be mindful of our time here. Um, so we had Emma was the only one who got a slide in on time, so she gets to introduce herself with a slide. She already introduced herself, but you were kind of a black shadow. Anyway, okay, yes, this is this is me, um, Emma, as I said, and so excited to work with you all and meet you. This is such a cool program. Yeah, I love this pitch with all the ferns in it. Okay, yes. so let's go on <laughs> to the work. <laughs> <laughs> let's go on to the next slide, and we will actually ask for all the fellows. We do need to send a picture and a short description of yourself to Sarah W. Um, so we will reintroduce you as the new classes come in. So we have that lecture. Okay, so a couple of hardcore things for everyone, that's students, including fellows. Um, to work in the international stage, we have to use a variety of platforms and tools. And I know as mostly people uh, from the Americans, I'll just make that assumption, uh, we don't use some of these tools the same way other nations and um, organizations do. The UN uses Twitter a lot. So it's important to understand how to use Twitter, how to use Twitter to 
to follow documents in the UN. Um, the most annoying UN habit is to announce a new document on Twitter, and that way you can find the document. If you go to their website, it will take you about a year to figure out where the document actually sits, because the way the UN titles documents is not easy for Google to search on. So just be aware that everyone needs to have a Twitter account. Um, it's something that we, we use a lot. Um, especially for finding documents. So if you're not familiar with Twitter, set one up. Um, you can always break, take, you know, this, uh, break it apart by the end of the class, but we do need you to use those Twitter. We also use Twitter to ask all of our guest speakers questions. Second is that we're going to use a variety of different platforms. We find that one platform doesn't actually work well, so we have to use a combination. Um, Sarah will lead you through all this as we go through the semester. But the number one thing is Slack. If you have not used Slack, um, I know some of the CSU students were with us in 400 last year, so they've used Slack. Um, Slack is basically a project team platform. It's designed for teams to work together on projects. So Sarah has asked a couple of times to put your preferred email on the Google Sheet, it's in the chat box, to make sure she can set you up and invite you into Slack. We will go into a general Slack channel, and as we develop our teams, each team will have its own channel to work with in Slack. Why do we use Slack? Um, for those of you getting grades, that's how we mark participation, because um, we can see every time you participate in Slack or when you don't participate in Slack. So that gives us a, a measure of making sure everyone stays engaged and helps the teams move forward. Next slide. And Sarah, jump in if you need to. Um, again, we need a preferred email. Doesn't matter if it's a Gmail or else. There's a big Google Docs that's already set up and we would probably need to invite you to that. Um, and be aware that the Google Docs is a combination from last year's class and we also put some examples of what the final products look like so you can get a sense of where you're heading and what we're trying to get done. And again, that UN site is obnoxious. <laughs> but it's important just to sort of work your way through it now because the acronyms are pretty dense and it takes a while to get through them. Next slide. So Zoom instructions again. I just put it in there a couple of times, make sure everybody has it. Next. <laughs> okay, when you join Zoom, a little bit of Zoom etiquette. Number one, make sure you turn your mic off, especially for those of you who may join by phone. I'll feel free to join by phone as you need to. Just be aware that sometimes you will not be able to see some things like the chat box doesn't work remarkably well on the phone. Um, so do make sure you mute your mic. Another thing is uh, if you find with big conference calls, please turn off your video if you're moving your computer around. That gets to be pretty wild. Last year, we, as, as Sarah G and Sarah W remember, we had um, a gentleman who joined us from the UN who was driving his car as far as we could figure out while <laughs> Zoom. So we'd get these dizzying views of his, the roof of his car. Um, so please turn off the video if you're moving your computer around. Um, feel free to use a virtual background. Uh, I, everyone's in different personal settings now. Um, feel free to put whatever fun virtual background you want. I like to say pet photobombs happen. I have dogs who bark in the back all the time. So if your pet goes skittering through, don't be embarrassed. Just tell us what the name of the animal is. Um, and we can all keep on keeping on. Um, you'll, I'm sure you'll see all my dogs before the end of this. Um, and feel free to turn off your video during use, whether you have a bandwidth problem or so forth. Um, if we need to share, share faces, um, we'll ask you to turn your video on if you can. As you notice, my video is off because I tend to get, uh, as Sarah calls it, robotic um, from my internet connection. Next slide. Okay, what I had a plan to do is to just do a very quick introduction to the COP. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this because I wanna make sure we get to our assignment. So this again, this, these will be in uh, recorded. I just wanna make sure we all had the same sort of platform to start with. So number one, we're talking about the international negotiations under the UN Framework Convention for climate change, fondly known as the UNFCCC. This is one convention of many, and this is the convention that we'll spend most of our time focusing on along with another. Next slide. It's important to think about where this sits in the UN, and we will say this again and again and again. Um, the UN operates on consensus, except for one body, and that is the Security Council. So given that consensus, 
how the UN gets everybody to consensus is a major process in of itself. So it's important to understand where these different bodies sit. They're called organs. There are seven major organs of the UN. Each one has a slightly different function. Um, we will mainly be working under what's known as ECSOC or the Economic and Social Council, which is where most of the major conventions sit. So again, don't worry about the details. We're gonna go through this again. This is just our quick introduction. Next slide. So why this becomes important as we move through is that we will be working with two different areas of the UN. One is the Framework Convention on Climate Change, and another is a set of frameworks that were put together to guide the UN as a whole, and that's the Sustainable Development Goals. And we'll talk more about those in a minute. But what's important to see, there's Diane! Diane just popped in. <laughs> she can do this better than I can. She's been at this longer. And Diane, do you want to introduce yourself? We already made up lots of stuff about you. Oh, then I'm not sure I do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm Diane Husick. I'm the Dean of the School of Natural and Health Sciences and um, teach a course on climate negotiations at the international stage or at, on the international stage and have worked with Gillian and, and Sarah and several other people here for a number of years. So. Thank you, Diane. So you can see in the meeting minutes, we've got a lot of good uh, fellows online, which is pretty exciting. Um, and uh, my class is online. Sarah G starts next week. Uh, Sarah H is start next week. So we'll see more new faces next week. So I, I wanted to put this slide in the slide deck just so you could always have a, a quick reference to the UN structure. The slide may be a little hard to read. It just gives you an idea of the seven major organs and that we're working across two organs. One is called the UN General Assembly that meets in September. They're the organ that approves the Sustainable Development Goals. The UNFCCC sits under the organ known as the Economic and Social Council. And the UNCCC normally meets year round. It's important to note, year round, it has several meetings. I think there's one coming up in October. The main meeting is called the Conference of the Parties, usually meets in the winter. Um, it's not meeting this year, it will meet in 2021 in Glasgow, Scotland. Next slide. So a brief background on why this is important. In 1992, the first Earth Summit was held in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. And it's a nice little note to make. The UN names all of its actions after whatever city the action took place in. So it's a nice little hint as to where things take place. So you'll notice that this is the Rio conventions because it took place in Rio. Um, so you'll see this sort of pattern occur. The Montreal protocols took place in Montreal and that's a, a UN convention of how they name things. Again, why Google can be a little bit hard to figure that out. The Rio Convention 1992 was an important step on thinking about the role of the environment and the sustainable future for all people on this planet. And there were a couple of major documents that came through out of the UNF triple of the Rio Conventions. We won't spend a lot of time in all of them. There are two I'd like to highlight. One is the Convention on Sustainable Development. And the second is the Convention Oops, and that should be the Conference of, on Sustainable Development, my apologies. And the second is the Convention on Climate Change that started out with the Kyoto Mechanism. Next slide. So the UNFCCC is one of the three Rio conventions. It meets every year, and one of its primary goals is to look at the parties that meet under what's still known as the Kyoto Protocol, and you'll see here's another acronym, CMP, um, which predates the Paris Agreement by several years. And we'll talk about how Kyoto versus Paris Agreement later on the semester. Next slide. So the COP is what you hear referred to a lot. The COP is what we're our, sort of our target for this class to make sure everyone understands all the pieces that come together at each COP. And again, keep in the back of your mind that little thing known as consensus. The COP is where the consensus becomes a major driver. And I'd also say to all of my different colleagues, please jump in if I misspeak or something needs clarification. And again, I put some acronyms here to note the COP itself has several bodies within itself that all work at different times of the year. 
um, what's known as Substa is meeting right Diane met in June or July and SBI meets in October. So these are constant meetings that go on throughout the year and they all come together at the COP. So you'll hear about these different frameworks, different timing and different pieces moving on, but it's not a one-stop shop. It's a sort of a steady process throughout the year. Next slide. So what we're all probably more familiar with is the Paris Agreement. Um, the Paris Agreement as a sort of seminal piece of work that came through after the Kyoto Protocol was set to expire. And what I want you to look at for the Paris Agreement, and again, we're going to show you a little bit more details, is a couple of key words that we want to hold in front of us for the rest of the semester. Transparent, ambitious, and differentiated. And why that becomes important is differentiated refers to every country having its own capacity to address sustainable development or address climate change or address the impacts of either of those two. So it's important to think about because the differentiated term comes in, it's a fairly new process coming into the UN that everybody is at a different place. And this has different impacts to the environment. When you look at how the environment moves, especially in terms of responsibility versus impact are not necessarily um, equitable. Next slide. Why is this important? Is that you have this sort of mechanisms moving, and again, we'll be come back to these slides, where you have the Paris Agreement versus Kyoto. Kyoto basically looked at two different categories of countries, roughly Annex 1, Annex 2, which meant essentially developed versus undeveloped. And as countries changed their GDP, fondly known as the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, and China, the, the strength of the Kyoto Protocol became more and more challenged. So the COP, which is this overarching mechanism, is dealing with all of these pieces that come together throughout the year. And what we'll be looking at is how do things, we'll introduce in a minute, called the Sustainable Development Goals move within all these bodies. And then how is we, as students focusing on the Sustainable Development Goals, put all this into context with the larger questions of global climate change, greenhouse gases, and environmental sustainability. Next slide. I'm going a little faster, I'm gonna be mindful of time. The end message that you need to get is words matter. And we're going to spend time going through individual words. There's a great article about how one lost comma can change a vision. And for those of us who are actually in Paris during this agreement, one word mistranslated almost torpedoed the entire agreement. And that was the word shall versus should on a sheer translation error. So it's important just to think about as we work our way through and you'll see uh, spend a lot of time on one or two words, why these words matter and where they are in the document matter and how they have influence on the sustainable development goals is important because that gives us a like, like kind of like a jet stream trail of where the money is moving from places like the World Bank and the development funds. So it's important to think about these dictate how things move. Next slide. So for example, I love this and my 400 students are probably groaning already because my favorite quiz questions is where does the term forest appear in the Paris Agreement? So we think about world forests and how much they contribute to global climate change um, through deforestation or through carbon sinks, et cetera. But the word forest in the Paris Agreement occurs in the finance section. So this is important to understand where dollars move and why something that's an environmental element gets negotiated in finance versus someplace else. Next slide. In contrast, oops, I think I put Sarah W asleep already. <laughs> Human rights um, appears in the preamble. And that's because human rights um, are a separate agreement that sit in their own separate organ under the Secretary General in the Office of Human Rights. So it's important to see how these things work together across different organs. The rights of indigenous peoples and local communities falls within the Paris Agreement through the mechanisms of the Climate Change Agreement, 
which the COP voted into place last year. Jillian, okay. can I comment about something there? Sure, please. Um, the um, preamble is not legally binding, which is another key part, whereas the actual articles are. And the, one of the big things when this agreement was put into place was the concern that human rights was in something that's not legally binding. Um, and part of that was part of that consensus or that compromise that has to be done. There are some countries that if human rights had been part of the actual articles would not have agreed to the Paris Agreement. That's a great point. And, and I see uh, someone commented that. Um, no, I and that's an ongoing, me. that's an ongoing discussion. People who were at COP last year, my, uh, last fall might have noticed that that came up in a lot of discussions about finance and especially moving forward on the, on the finance issue, which finally got tabled because of debates about whether human rights should be put in there or not. Yeah, and that's something we'll spend quite a bit of time on. Um, again, I like to ask students to think about, is climate change equitable? And if it's not equitable, why and why not? And how do you measure it? And where does it sit in the agreements? Um, so this issue of equity within the agreements is important and it's been something that's been ongoing for a long time. Next slide. I'm just being a little bit mindful of our time, so I'm glumping along here. The same thing occurs with oceans and culture. Oceans occurs in the preamble, like Diane just said, that's non-binding. You think the oceans occupy 71% of the Earth's surface, and the word oceans appears once in the entire Paris Agreement, which is something to think of. The other term you see in here, which I'd like to remind us that all landscapes have culture, and all cultures have landscapes. And this term, Mother Earth, was put in by the country of Bolivia. Um, turned out to be quite a bit of a debate on the floor on what they meant by Mother Earth. Um, but for them, it was an important cultural reference to the planet as a whole that actually managed to stay in the agreement through the last minute where it looked like they were going to actually pull it out or Bolivia was going to step out. So you can see where cultures and landscapes become very tightly entwined when you get to the level of the UN and UN agreements. Next slide. So we threw a lot at you. But what we're going to do today is look at a framework that will go into more detail um, that we will use for this class that gives us a, a, a way to organize ourselves in teams to think about the environmental issues that go into negotiations at the international scale. So going back to the Rio, the Rio was in 1992. Rio plus 20 was in 2012, 20 years later. The Sustainable Development Goals came out of, uh, in part, from a Butland Commission report of 1986, that or 87, sorry, that talked about sustainable development for the first time. Let's go on to the next slide. In that first time, I'm going to explain this, the sustainable development was defined as protecting the planet such that the use of those sustainable resources was preserved for future generations. At this time, a series of goals were expiring. Um, so the question was, what was going to replace these goals at the UN level? And these were the Millennium Development Goals. And the Millennium Development Goals were originally designed as a way to address poverty um, and trying to create economic equality worldwide and to lift impoverished nations out of poverty uh, in some sort of coherent fashion, would be a way to say it. But in the US, we tend not to think about this, the Millennium Development Goals much, and which is why this little picture is here, it's my favorite story, the Millennium Development Goals, is the Millennium Development Goal number eight that we are busy using right now. Um, and every last one of you that has a cell phone in your pocket is using Millennium Development Goal number eight every day. And that was the role of global telecommunication. So in that goal, it set the vision that the world must be able to communicate and must be able to communicate with, itself, so it, with each other and to be able to communicate in some sort of seamless fashion. And why that becomes important is that, that leads companies like AT&T or Orange, if you're in the East or Safari, if you're in places like Africa or in PESA or other such companies to work together to create a global platform, which means today you can take your little cell phone and call Africa if you feel like it, 
or the University of Derby or Australia can join in on this Zoom call at no particular cost. And that's a direct result of the Millennium Development Goals. So the question is when the Millennium Development Goals expired in 2015, oh my goodness, I have to be very mindful of time, is what they were gonna replace with. So let's go on to the next one. And this class ends at 2.15 and we will lose Sarah Whipple shortly here. So she's gonna need to turn over um, control to me pretty soon. So as I said in the Rio summit, the idea was that we need to develop come to a, some sort of sustainable development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And at Rio plus 20, a document with an unlikely name of the future we want, which is a negotiated text, said that we want to articulate goals that will replace the Millennium Development Goals, but look at sustainable development as their main driver. So in those goals, we were including the environment for the first time. So if you look at the Millennium Development Goals, they were focused on people, um, reducing poverty, and we moved to Sustainable Development Goals, which focus on the environment. So it's a very different step. The original Sustainable Development Goals were, uh, Millennium Development Goals, uh, sorry, the original documents on sustainable development was called Our Common Future. The goals, the sustainable development goals came out of the future we want. And you can find all those documents online. And those are negotiated text by consensus. Right. And a lot of input for that was done through an incredible social media and internet campaign to get input from basically every country in the world. There was a lot of background work and a lot of participation in that process. Yeah, and that's a really good point because this goals were supposed to guide the UN and quote unquote all of its expenditures for the next until 2030. So basically the next 15 years from 2015 to 2030, the sustainable development goals guide the expenditures of the largest financial institution in the world, which is the World Bank. Next slide. And again, from the US perspective, we tend not to think about it the same way, but it's sort of coming around a bit, a bit. So here are the sustainable development goals. If you haven't seen them already, they end up in the sort of oddball number of 17. And there's a long story about how they ended up with 17, which we'll go into at a later date. Each one of these goals has a series of targets behind it. So as you look at these goals, be sure to look at the targets. Um, and there are some great videos that we'll play next week on how to, how to communicate 17 goals to 9 billion people. Um, and it's actually a really fun way of thinking about these goals have to communicate to everyone across multiple languages, multiple um, abilities, et cetera. So you'll see a lot of use of art, um, art graphics, et cetera, to try and express what we mean by these goals. So these 17 goals is what you need to look for and look at and decide what are your three main areas of interest. And that includes the these the Yay Fellows and all the students, because this is how your teams will be organized. Your teams will be organized around one STG, and that's what you will follow for this semester. Next slide. Okay, Sarah says she's hopping off, so I'm going to turn around and share my screen. So give me a second to do that. Any questions while I get myself organized? Put a couple things in the chat that some of you guys might want to check out afterwards because there's some great history related to the, the debates that went into the formation of those 17 goals. Yeah, I'll, I'll just point out that the, that the 17 that there's a lot of overlap between the 17 goals. So if you're interested in ecology, ecology overlaps with just about every one of them. If you're interested in climate, it every one of those things is related to climate. So you don't have don't feel constrained and feel expanded. Okay, can you all see my screen now? I hope. I see a thumbs up, thank you. Um, so this is our task. And we'll spend you know, the next sort of five, 10 minutes um, and give everyone a chance to sort of look at these tasks and think about the task. Um, and by next week, we actually are gonna ask, get a poll because we're gonna start setting up our teams. Again, remember, um, and part why we're going through this in detail is we have other teams that will join via first watching this video, um, who will have the same task. So you'll see students on your teams that are not necessarily on the call today. So number one, 
just take a look at the goals. They're, they're full of great pictures. They are well written. They're easy to figure out. Um, they have clear targets. What captures your attention? Is it climate change? Is it biodiversity, life below water, life on land? Each one of these goals has a different emphasis area, um, but they all have targets. And the question to think about is, what would you like to research for a semester to find out more about where this goal and target takes place, not, not just worldwide, but also in your own backyard? And I think that's important that we think about what happens in our own community and not disassociate ourselves and say, not my backyard, but somebody else's backyard. For example, there's a major hurricane heading to the US coast um, right now. So if we look at some of the extreme events and some of the predictions of recovery and um, infrastructure and so forth, those are relevant to the US as well as they are to other countries in other areas. And the impact of extreme events um, the predictions of extreme events, all these types of things occur elsewhere. So once you choose your three, what we need you to do is to tweet those choices in order to a hashtag. So this gives you the opportunity to figure out how to use Twitter if you don't use it already. Um, if you use Twitter a lot and don't want to be mixed up with your personal Twitter account, feel free to set up a separate Twitter account because you can easily take it down when you're done. Um, and send that to both me and Sarah. And what we will do is assign everybody to a team for starters, put that in Google Docs and put you on a Slack channel associated with that team. So you'll get all those invitations. So by the time we get to next week, you'll have an idea of where you sit and hopefully some of the other classes will have also caught up by then. So also by the end of the week, you will have access to Slack Slack contains multiple channels. Um, if you've not used Slack, it's a great program to use. It operates very differently from either Zoom or internet uh, or um, email. You'll be put in a channel. You can run Slack on a laptop, but you can also run it on a cell phone. I would urge you to do both. Uh, again, for students in the class, that's one way that we can see who's participating in one. And I know my students have used Slack before, um, but it's a, a a work platform that's actually used professionally so we can develop these teams outside of internet and try to not, um, emailing people back and forth or something crazy like that. Uh, Google Docs has some problems with the file size, which is why we use the combination with Google Docs and Slack. For every team, a Yay Fellow, and hopefully the Yay Fellows will distribute themselves out nicely. And Sarah H, you do have three Yay Fellows, so you may sort of be wobbled around a bit, um, but we'll assign gay fellows to different teams. So you'll each be on a different team. So you get a chance to work in a leadership role with the other students who will be on those teams. Any questions at this point? Hi, I have a quick question. Sure. Um, for the um, Twitter, where we're going to be tweeting um, our top three um, sustainable development goals, would you like the um, Yay fellows to do that as well, or will yes, we? So we okay. so at least have a, a sense of your preference. And all you need to do is tweet STG1, STG3, STG5, or something awesome. like that. So Perfect. Those are my Thank top you. three choices. You're welcome. Um, and then we'll just have to sort of wobble and try and get everybody into equal size groups from there. And again, remembering we have other classes, so the group size may, uh, excuse me, fluctuate as we move forward. <coughs> other questions? How about from the students of the class? As I know for my class, most of you guys have used Slack before, um, so you should be fairly comfortable. I see Pam. Oh, Pam is now online. Pam, do you want to introduce yourself real quick? Sure. I'm stop sharing my screen real quick, so if you want to hop in there. There's Pam. Hi, everybody. I'm Pam Templer. I'm a professor in the Department of Biology at Boston University, and I'm excited to work with all of you. So you missed, I got to share a fun slide from the ESA <laughs> plaque. <laughs> we had a good time in Madrid. We did have a good time. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it is uh, <coughs> on that. Yeah, and I see that Hurricane Laura has moved up to a category four. Oh, yeah. So I'm gonna go back to sharing my slide. Any other questions to pop up? I know this first week is a little bit of everyone trying to get their feet underneath. Oh, we have another. Thunderstorm. We're having dry thunderstorms coming through, and for those of you who don't know, we are a massive 
of wildfires. So we have one that's about 60 miles from us. So it's very smoky here. Hey, Gillian, um, a question that we have, since some of us have courses that cannot meet during this time period, uh -huh. how, do you, how do you envision those classes getting engaged with the bigger group? Is that through the fellows? Correct. So we'll have to do sure, two stages, obviously, with Susie's group, that's going to be even harder. Um, one is that they need to be engaged through the fellows, and two, that the teams will need to set up meeting times that work best for those teams. So, and then they will report back to this main group as to what that team has accomplished each week and where those still teams are. Does that help answer that question? Yep, and so we can share these tasks with our other courses that aren't part of today's Exactly. Yeah, got it. So, so we'll be using a lot of breakout rooms. So each team will have an opportunity to meet face to face uh, with the main group on Wednesdays. Um, and depending on how the classes work their ways out, we may set up a second time that, you know, a couple of us professors are sit down and see how the teams are doing. But, you know, as you know, we've got nine time zones, I think, in the project. It's something pretty crazy. So it's hard to come up with a time that works for us all. And that's what, how we can best make it work. Other questions? So again, by the end of the week, you need a couple of tasks that we need for everyone to do. Number one is fill out the Google Docs with your preferred email so Sarah can add you to a channel. Number two is once you're added to that channel, post a picture of yourself or post a picture of something fun to introduce yourselves because most of your team members will probably be from a different institution. So it's important that we introduce ourselves because we'll be working together through the entire semester. Each team we hope will be about five to six people. Some may be larger, some may be smaller, depends on how it all works out with the different size classes. Each team will have presentations and write-ups to complete by the end of the semester. Some students will have grades associated, others are interns. Um, so the idea is to work together as a team towards that final product and we'll share more with you what those final products will be uh, looking like as we move forward. And every team will have a Yay Fellow assigned to it. And those Yay Fellows are your core contacts for those teams um, to keep students engaged, everybody moving forward, doing research and setting goals for the teams each week. Any other questions on that? So that's my last slide for today. Um, we will meet the same time next week and again our time, meeting time will be from 1 to 2.15 mountain time. Um, next week we're going to dive more deeply into the Paris Agreement on the role of state development goals. We will welcome the new classes that are coming on board next week um, as, as they get started. So we'll spend some time in the beginning introducing Way Fellows or seeing if any new other classes are online um, and then work our way forward. We found last year it was actually a lot of fun learning to work together as teams coming up with um, case studies, um, comparing the different institutional campuses. Last year, and, and Diane and Pam and others can jump in here, and Sarah G, uh, we had teams that worked on things from like No Hunger, Sustainable Development Goal number two, that looked at hunger on campuses and compared all the campuses on the team and found um, some remarkable numbers of uh, the number of hungry students on campus, what was the campus doing about it, food banks, et cetera. So that's how you can take that project and bring it home. You know, so the sustainable development goal number two is no hunger, but we have hunger here on our campuses and hunger in most of our communities. So what are we doing locally as well as what the sustainable development goal is asking to do globally? <coughs> Another great example is sustainable development goal number five, which is on gender. You know, how last year the student projects looked at um, how well universities actually had women or achieved equity in administration and in senior positions. And they compared among the universities, they ran surveys with different universities. I think they, they got like 300 surveys done, a large number of surveys done to look at this question of sustainable development goal number five and looking at women in, in positions of power. And another team looked at water um, and looked at different watershed projects that were going on at the different universities. I think, Sarah G, that was your team that led the flow project, is that correct? Yeah, they looked um, specifically at the international agreement between the US and Canada on managing the Great Lakes, because we're on the Great Lakes. 
So as you see, there are lots of these types of projects that the Sustainable Development Goals becomes the framework that works for all the institutions to be both local, regional, and national. As you look at data sets, access to water, environmental justice, Flint, Michigan, lead in water occurs in many, many communities uh, worldwide. And what are the laws and policies that um, address lead in water? Um, reading, if that's what you know, you're interested in. Um, one group also looked at infrastructure on campuses that looked at you know, how much green energy, clean energy infrastructure was on the different campuses. Um, so that's the type of project that we're looking for, taking a case study, taking a local interest or a local project, pulling it together as a multi-institutional team to present to an international audience. So one of the feedbacks that we got, um, for example, from sustainable development goal number two, was actually surprised from the international audience that we would have hunger on our US campuses and that we would have students that were food insecure right on our US campuses. So that was an important sharing point that here's a global goal that we have not achieved on a major research one R1 institutional campus within the US. At Colorado State, it was something crazy like five out of 10 students has experienced food insecurity on our campus. The food bank comes to our campus twice a week. So highlighting that on how students are trying to deal with debt and you know, just affordability is so important at the international stage. So for my colleagues, before we close, because we're almost at our time, does anybody like to, I'll stop sharing my scene, maybe share some thoughts from some of our other students or other colleagues. I see Sarah put something about COVID. I think another important thing is equity and thinking about the impacts of disease pandemics uh, across different racial ethnic minorities um, is an important thing. COVID seems to hit African-American communities harder than other communities. So how would you explore that as a team that is representative of different universities and different communities. So let me turn it over to my colleagues. Any sort of parting thoughts for this first class? Lots to think about. <laughs> yeah. But the intersections of the issues, I think, are really important. Uh, and, and Sarah, you mentioned this, that there's a lot of overlap in terms of SDGs. But even if we think about how do we take one of those and bring it home, almost every one of them are being impacted by COVID now. So you layer the pandemic on top of that or a um, uh, number of issues as we're coming into a political season. Uh, think about what's in the, you know, the, the campaign platforms or what's not in them and, and so on. Yeah, thanks for that, Diane. So um, Lynn or Sarah G, I don't think Sarah, I think Sarah H stepped out. Either one of you have a supporting thoughts? Pam? I'm looking forward to working with all of you. I think we're we're breaking new territory here. We did this last year at a pilot, pilot, pilot version, and now we're we've been flung online, but with a lot more people. And uh, our fearless leader is going to harness a dragon for us. So. <laughs> I still got work on the logo. <laughs> uh, I'm excited, excited to do this. So. Yeah, I just I feel the same way. And um, I guess one thought to the students is if, if you if you don't know much about the origins of the UN, I think it's worth going back and just doing some Googling and reading up on how it started. Um, and I think you'll even be more inspired than when you see it in person to see nations sitting down at tables together and talking civilly, even if they disagree and can't get results. Um, it's, an, you know, it's an it's been a pretty incredible system that's set up and the fact that it does still happen every year and Things can happen even if they happen slowly um, is maybe the preferable way to go in my mind than to go to war that, you know, or other, other remedies that humans use in the past. So just wanted to throw that out there. Yeah, and, and Leah and anybody, um, part of our goal here is to compile um, a library of modules, but also to, to curate useful things. So if you're if you're searching around and you find something really useful, whether it's a Wikipedia page or an article or a video or something, um, let us know so we can incorporate that. Because some, some of these things you search for them and you can find a wide range of random information, but there's some really good stuff out there. We wanna help you find it. And you, we want you to help us find it. And I'll just echo what Sarah said is that 
this is your experience as well. So if you have ideas on how to improve this, please speak up. Don't assume it's set in stone and this is how the YAD yeah network works. No, I think we're all in this together figuring it out. Um, and it's an exciting time. So please speak up, share questions, concerns, ideas, brainstorming, anything you have, we're all yours. Yeah, thanks for that. I mean, Corjay, this is a, a new voyage. Um, the National Science Foundation just funded us literally like, what, two weeks ago? Um, so we're all excited to dive into this new adventure together as colleagues and let's move forward. So with that, I think I actually have to go teach another class. Um,